You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast, broadcasting recorded from the Vivid Seats studios. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Use promo code OVERTIME in the Vivid Seats mobile app to save $100 on all ticket purchases, first time, customers only. So today's one of those days where you probably know what we're talking about more so than I know. Because you can see the title in the description, which usually those aren't very descriptive anyways, but you at least have a better idea, because I don't have a clue what's going on right now. I've got a tiny little dabble of a thought in regards to the uh, the Andrew Luck thing, and I kind of thought about... So it was kind of weird yesterday, because I recorded on Sunday, and I got about 90% done, and then on Monday I had to record a new intro and then record the second half, and I didn't want to get super elaborate in the second half, even though I knew new information, like we got new players, and like I had this new thought about the, it's like, yeah, final thought, and close it out, and we'll, you know, because then it just gets confusing, like, how did you know that, are you, can you see the future, it's like, no, man, it's, it's Monday now, don't worry about it, I'm confusing myself just describing it, so, Andrew Luck thoughts, we got some new players, we'll look at that, not even sure exactly what we're up to as far as did we get to 90? Because we added a bunch of people. Three people, I think? Because I know we added two, and then I think we got another guy from Baltimore. See, I don't even know. I got, I got to look it up, man. I don't, I'm telling you. I should just start saying broadcasting live from the Vivid Seat Studios because that's, that's, we're going live, son. If anyone's listening from a Madison radio station, just call me up, man. I'll come in and do three hours. I got no problem with that. Sports radio coming at ya. I got this. Um, all right, so then we talk about the new guys, and then there's some news out of training camp, and we'll see where that leaves us. If that's not good enough, I'm sure there are plenty of questions, comments, concerns coming at me. I know I got another question and some more Facebook things. Plenty to dis- discuss always. The only thing left for you to do is to remember not to forget to get into the draft NFL season long tournament. Because as I've said, I don't want some other bum Bears fan to win a million dollars when some good Americans, that's right. I mean, really, are you an American if you're a Bears fan? I don't think so. Should we deport them? I don't know. That's a separate conversation. I mean, who would take them? That's See, it's it gets complicated. I would like a Packers fan to take home the million dollar grand prize. And better than that, I'd love for somebody that listens to this podcast to be able to nearly quit your job depending on where you are in life, and to have that happen because I advised it to you. That would make me happy. And remember, you jump in on a draft, they're running every few minutes, no management, set it and forget it, no trades, waiver wires, etc. And remember, limited time only, you get a free entry into the best ball championship when you make your first deposit, but you got to use promo code PACKERNET, a free shot and a million bucks just by using promo code PACKERNET when you make your first deposit on Draft. Just search Draft in the App Store or go to Draft.com. Come play free with promo code PACKERNET. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. 
Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, so random thought of the day, probably random thought A of the day. One of the things that I don't like about the Andrew Luck situation, especially with all the people, and granted it's, it's a small minority, but the certain subsection of people saying I have the right to boo and all that kind of stuff, it kind of reinforces the whole us versus them mentality, right? Football players, especially now, I don't know if this always used to be the case. It seemed like back in the day it was very like my team versus your team, players against players, like I don't like Bear. Now it just seems like they're all in a big club and they all like each other and they all look out for each other and it's like, look, we're in this together. Let's try to make each other a bunch of money and get out of here. And Aaron Rodgers is is like king of that group. He is extremely pro player, especially Packers, but he's, he's always been that way about everybody. He's anti-media. He's anti sort of establishment, I guess, if you're talking about teams. Not in super horrible kind of Florio kind of ways, but just like, look, it's us against them. They're not looking out for us. Nobody's looking out for us. We got to look out for each other. That's just sort of the mentality of a lot of players. And again, Aaron Rodgers is clearly very much in that camp. The negative side of this, and I guess it's fair if we have to divide up into teams, of course we're going to be on the side of the teams, even though some people pretend they're not. Of course you are. You're not going to follow the players if they leave. You're always going to be a Packer fan. You talk a lot of trash, but you are a fan of the team. Well, the Packers take advantage of the play. Well, fine, then go be a fan of the player, and then when they retire, you can retire from football. The, the, the biggest thing that I don't like is, is realistically, though, if, if let's just say Aaron Rodgers is correct, and he kind of is, and a lot of the players are correct, the fans only care about you as long as, as you're playing for them and winning for them, and that's true. So why should they care about us? In other words, you're Aaron Rodgers right now, multi-bajillionaire. You got more money than you could ever. I mean, you, you, you almost can't be stupid enough to spend all his money. That's a lot of money. Like, Adrian Peterson blew all his money, and you can kind of look at it, all the money that he's made, and it's like, that'd be tough, but I could probably do it. Especially as long as he's been playing, you kind of spread it out. Aaron Rodgers, that massive infusion of cash that he got over the last year, it's like, man, I don't even know where to start. Like, you can't even start with cars. Like, that's, that's you're wasting, you're running out of time at this point, and cars just isn't going to get you there. I can buy a car every hour and probably never run out of money. You got to start looking into, like, island resorts, or just islands. Like, you, you know that uh, Atlantis over there in the Bahamas or whatever? I don't want to buy the resort. I'd, I'll just buy that, that piece of land there. So you, you're that guy. You've got that much money. Um, you've got a very small group of friends that you care about, some of whom are players, others are just people. But the team you're on, you, you've seen it. So you know that you can't rely on them, depend on them. All right, they'll go to the ends of the earth for you right now, but there will come a time when they wouldn't spit on you if you were on fire. It's a slight exaggeration, but again, you know, you see it with Clay. You saw it with Jordy. You see it with Randall Cobb. I mean, these are guys that are like, look, I'll, I'll play for less. I mean, granted, they did offer Jordy something, but it was kind of an insulting amount. According to Clay, it was a matter of you'll get nothing, right? He, he went somewhere else and even came back and was like, are you sure? Because I'll literally play for anything. And they're like, nope, you will literally play for, for I mean, actually, no. You won't even play for nothing because I won't keep you on the roster for nothing. I wouldn't not pay you to be here. And I'm not saying the Packers are doing anything wrong. I'm just trying to get into the mentality of of the player. Because you listen to, to I don't know, maybe try to think in, in romanticized terms. And, and a lot of us do this with, you know, you, you do it for the team. You do it for the fans. You do it. I don't think that's true. Maybe there were some, some people that did. And maybe there was a time in which this was more prevalent. But you just look around the league. And again, if I'm Aaron Rodgers, and this is me. I'm not talking about this is what I think Aaron Rodgers would do because I think he's... I'm just saying if it's me, the fans couldn't care less about me. 
I'm, I'm watching Andrew Luck, but I'm seeing me. I'm seeing what would happen if I said, after all I've done for this team, after all I've done for the Green Bay Packers, if I decided in my life that I can't do this anymore, my body is broken, I'm literally going to the bathroom and blood is coming out, and I am worried about the safety and health of my life. I'm worried about having years cut short. I'm worried about having kids and grandkids, and I don't know their name, and I need help eating soup. I'm worried about the fact that I can't even walk anymore by the time I'm 60. I'm legitimately getting worried about these things, and I think it's, it's, it's in my best interest to retire because I just got a brand new injury. Then these people who proclaim to love me and care about me, these people who bought my jerseys and wanted to hug me and take pictures with me and please sign my baby, we love you, I named my kid after you, they're going to hate me, they're going to boo me, they're going to throw things at me, they're going to be scathingly angry at me. And again, fully understand that this is a small subsection. There are going to be some people that understand and all that. But this, this, is, this, is, this is what I'm seeing when I watch Andrew Luck get booed. This is what players are seeing. And you see all over Twitter players saying, what are you guys doing? Why are you doing this? They're seeing fans as just these Neanderthal things. Angry, irrational, dumb people who don't care about other human beings. So you got these organizations that are just rich, money-making machines that just care about winning, and if you're not winning, we don't care about you, and the fans are no different. And the only reason I bring this up is because when you think about Rodgers and you think about him playing for a really long time, you know he even went on to say as long as it's a, a love affair with the game, that's as long as it lasts. I mean, and what what is going to stop a player from just saying, I don't need this anymore and I don't care, especially as much money as guys are making these days? It just it, it was a very unfortunate thing, and I'm worried that it was somewhat of a wake-up call to a lot of football players. Because even if you love playing the game, every time you line up under center as a quarterback, you realize that you're getting a lot of money, but you're a stooge. And it would be really hard for me personally to not be jaded, to hear the cheers from a bunch of hypocrites who are going to hate me if I ever decide to make a decision in my own best interest. These people aren't my family. They don't care about me. They don't like me. They don't love me. All the things that they say about me is is, is a lie. And he's already starting to see it. He, he was injured a year, and then he had a down year with injuries. And you've already got a bunch of people saying, and Packer fans, saying he's, he's overrated. We need to move on. We need to draft his replacement. Packer fans who jumped right on the bandwagon of he's, he's impossible to get along with. He's this. He's that. He's already starting to see it. And if he has another bad year, it's just going con- to reach a fever pitch. And all I'm saying is it, good on him for sticking around because I'd be just looking for a way out, which wouldn't take me very long to figure out a way. And again, it, it really just comes down to I do it because I enjoy doing it and that's it. And that's an unfortunate situation for all of us as Packer fans to be in. He's in this for him, and that's really the only reason he needs to be in it, and it's the only reason he's going to be in it. And that's true for a lot of these guys. As long as they have enough money, um, and, and Rogers certainly does, it's really just a matter of why. If in, Unless you are madly in love with this game and you really just want to win Super Bowls and, and have memories and all that kind of stuff, why are you doing this? I don't know. I, I, just, I, I find that is very, very unfortunate. And it upsets me what happened to Andrew Luck for that reason because I, it just it, it feels like that was... And, and maybe it'll just blow over, and maybe this is nothing new, but it feels like it was somewhat of a wake-up call for a lot of football fan, or football players to realize that nobody cares about you. And, and as much as you might know the people up top don't care about you, it ends up being true about a lot more people than you thought. The, the coaches that cared about you end up signing off on you getting cut. You know, they're going to talk to the coaches before you get cut, and they're going to go, yep, it's time to move on. And again, the fans that proclaim to care about you, they, they don't care. And again, I, I, this isn't true for everybody. But I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, foot, football fans aren't going and doing a survey and meeting a thousand people like, what do you think of me? What do you think of what do you? Andrew Luck doesn't get to talk to every single fan. He didn't get to go into the stands and say, what do you think about this decision? To hear the people say, it really hurts, but I respect you and I love you for what you did. He just heard the boos. I'm sure there was applause. I'm sure there was, we love you, Andrew. He didn't hear it because it was drowned out from the boos. And again, it was a lot more than Andrew Luck that just got booed. I think every single football player, in a sense, was booed in that instance. To know that your body can be completely broken and the fans will hate you if you try to walk away. That's kind of chilling to me. 
and it would make me bitter. And, and not only would it be, I'm only in this for the money and the enjoyment for myself personally. And once I have enough money and don't care about this, it, it's, it's beyond that. It's to the point where it's, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here for these people. I don't want to play for these people. They're bad people. I don't want to be here for this organization. They're bad people. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying I agree with that. I don't think fans are bad people or necessarily football teams are bad people. They're just doing a job. And everybody knows what it is when they sign up. I'm, I'm just saying you could see how a person would get jaded in that direction. And I'm also saying please try to think about that going forward. If a player holds out, if, if, if Devontae Adams next year holds out for a contract, please, please be understanding. Please don't don't getting get hateful of the guy or any of that kind of stuff. If Kenny Clark doesn't get a contract and decides next year he's not setting foot on the football field until he gets his twenty million dollar deal, just just you know, let the man run his life. I mean, th- th- there's football and then there's outside of football stuff. You want to critique football, fine, but what they want to do with their lives and and you know how much money they make is is sort of an outside of football situation. Sometimes it overlaps to where people don't play because of it. Sometimes it overlaps because people retire because of the the battering that they've been taking. Let them make their decisions. It's not helping us to show the players that we don't actually care about them. We only care about them so much as they're successful. Otherwise, we hate them. That's not doing us any favors. It's, it's pushing people out of here very rapidly. Anyways, again, random thought. So there's been quite a bit of roster shuffling lately. Um, the So going all the way back to the 11th, the Packers picked up a cornerback by the name of Derek Jones. The only reason I bring that up, there have been three cornerbacks that have been picked up recently. Now again, I, I, I've been saying that I have some concerns about cornerback, and I, I don't necessarily think this is an accident. Not to say that everybody's bad, but maybe the, the bottom section of, in other words, the depth isn't exactly where we want it to be. I've mentioned how uh, Mr. Nairo isn't exactly up to snuff, and maybe some of these lower-tier guys aren't quite up to where they'd like them to be. Now, it's still kind of a weird situation, considering if you're looking at it, we, we've got Jair, Josh Jackson, Kevin King, Tremont, Kadar. That's five. And Tony Brown, that's six. I don't think we're going to keep more than six. So, I, I, you know, even if, okay, the guys after that aren't great, are, are we just trying to find maybe better practice squad guys? I don't know. It's kind of weird unless somebody's really hurt or maybe Kevin King's about to go back. I don't know. Again, it's always a question of is this deliberate or is it just a matter of, again, just trying to grab top end guy? Because as I said before, the Packers have had success with this. As much as it seems silly, you look, I went through the list of, of guys over the last you know year that um, that have actually been, you know, guys like Danny Vitale that were just like this. So maybe they're just trying to hit home runs. Like, this isn't working. Let's get rid of this guy. Let's just keep bringing these guys in and, and try to find these these home run hitters. Because, if, if you know, you figure if it's just a numbers game and, and one out of every ten ends up being a, a decent to good starter, let's just keep bringing them in, man. So I don't know. But um, two days ago there was a decent amount of, of uh, stuff going on. So Josh Jones was re- waived. He ends up clearing waivers, which is fairly significant because you look at it and say, okay, if there's a market, we should be able to trade him. If there was a market, if there was a bunch of teams interested, he would never have made it to free agency, right? Somebody would have claimed. Not one team put a claim in on him. So, you know, it just goes back to, first of all, when you look at it and say, I mean, there's so much that's weird about this. It was strange that when Petten came in, he didn't play. But looking at this whole thing, it kind of starts to make sense. Petten came in and said, I don't care that you're a second-round pick. You're not good. And I've even gone to bat and said, listen, all the people saying, listen, he's he's a good player in the box as far as being a linebacker, but he struggled in coverage. I don't even think that's true. I don't think he was very good at much of anything. You know, P- according to PFF in particular, he was about as good in run defense as he was in coverage, which is to say he wasn't good in either thing. And I think that bears itself out. I mean, if you're a, a good linebacker, if you're, you know, if you're a linebacker that runs a 4-2, and you're you're a good tackler and all that kind. Of, you're you're getting picked up. You wouldn't have got cut in the first place, and you would have gotten picked up because you're subpar in coverage. You know how many linebackers are subpar in coverage and don't have the speed and athleticism of Josh Jones. The fact of the matter is, the guy struggled in everything. Not one team wanted him. And last year, we didn't even have safeties, and we couldn't get Josh Jones on the field until we just got so decimated with injuries that it's like, fine, you can be number three, I guess. Mike Pettin never wanted him. 
Mike Pettin looked at him and said, this guy's no good. He, he, he's just either he doesn't understand it mentally, he can't process this, or he's just not that good of a football player in general. And now we've got 31 teams with pro personnel that have, have done their homework and have, have studied them and have watched them and said, I don't even think there's anything to work with here, which is stunning. As much as, as coaches and everything want to believe that they can coach a guy up and you just look at the raw athleticism and he's a second-round guy and even if they had like a third-round grade on him or whatever at the time and the Packers drafted him too early, which clearly they did, you would still think somebody would think, let's just give him a shot. There are teams with major deficiencies at safety, major deficiencies at linebacker. Nobody put a claim in on them. That's staggering. And it just makes you look back at, at the old days of uh, Ted Thompson wanting to draft him. Clearly not a good decision. And again, as I've been saying, I get so tired of the Packers with this relative athletic score garbage. Going after guys that don't put a lot on the field, but they've got athleticism. And yes, that kind of leans toward Rashawn Gary, and hopefully it doesn't go that way. But I'm, I'm just, I'm sick of it. There, there is almost no correlation between you know, for example, 40 time and how good of a football player you are. I've already gone through, especially and looked at wide receivers. Almost all the top receivers are like guys that run a four or five. Julio is like the one big exception because he's just the freak of all freaks, but it's not because he runs fast. You watch Julio Jones and you don't think, oh, he's a burner. That's not what comes to mind watching Julio. He's a great football player. He's a great route runner. He's a great 50-50 ball guy, strong, physical, etc. You know, it, it just, it's very clear to me that when you want football players, you just want good football players. And I think some teams get so caught up in you want the the guys with massive athleticism and upside, and then we can develop the rest. Knock that off, man. Get good football players. And for years, we've had this Ted Thompson thing where it's like, let's get really fast guys. Let's get really athletic guys. And it just it doesn't do anything. You just end up with fast guys that can't play football. I'm tired of it. Well, we want to be faster as a football team. I would like to get better as a football team. How about that? I don't know. Hopefully those days are somewhat behind us. We still, again, we still have a lot of time to evaluate what kind of a GM Brian Gutekunst is. Clearly, he's still interested in the um, high athleticism type people. You know, it, it sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Jair is an athletic guy, and it seems to be working out. Uh, the jury is still out on him. I don't know what Gutekunst's opinion was of, of but, you know, it, Kevin King. There you go. There's another one. It's all about his traits. Josh Jones, all about the traits. Jason Spriggs, it was all about the traits. Devontae Adams, it was not about the traits. Devontae Adams was not a guy that blew up the combine. He was just a great football player, and, and, and they just did a good job of, of finding and evaluating a good... He was one of those guys that I, I went back and watched his college film, and it was like, I don't get it. That, to me, is great scouting. When you watch something, and it's like, I don't, I don't know what it is about this guy, and then it turns out he's phenomenal. Or that, or just on tape, you can see he just wins, and he, you know, he don't know how, but he does it. Kenny Clark was was fantastic. You watch him, you know, I watched him, and I was like, he, he seems pretty good, but he seems kind of unpolished and all this kind of stuff. He wasn't blowing anybody away, and I don't know. I'm just, I'm personally, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of of getting really fast guys for the sake of getting really fast guys. And if if Rashawn Gary and Darnell Savage. And, and all these guys don't pan out, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to lose it. Anyways, I'm getting, getting a little off topic here. But Josh Jones clearly didn't pan out. It was clearly the Packers went too early on a guy that they were enamored by the fact that he's really fast. Um, you know, he's, he's a big, strong, fast missile. And it looked pretty cool for a while until you realize that it just didn't come together in terms of being a good football player, which ultimately is all that matters. On that exact same day, however, we also picked up linebacker James Folston and cornerback Jacques Khalili. You got to say it like that. It's the way you say his name. So Mr. Folston, as much as people got excited because, hey, we got a linebacker and that's cool. Um, he's, he's one of those pass rushing linebacker types. But uh, 6'3", 240, that would put him in the mold of more of the Clay Matthews type, more of the, uh, you know, smaller, quicker kind of guys. He, is, uh, he doesn't have a track record as far as being in the pros, which actually is somewhat of a benefit because, you know, the longer you're in the NFL and can't find a home, the more it becomes kind of solidified that this probably just isn't going to work for you. So he got picked up by the Arizona Cardinals as an undrafted free agent. Clearly that wasn't working out as far as the Cardinals were concerned, so the Packers are going to give him a shot. We'll see what happens. Jacquez Khalili, similar situation, um, 
UNLV Rebels, 5'11", 185, uh, undrafted free agent this year by the Jacksonville Jaguars. That obviously is a tough crowd um, to try to make that work. So we'll, we'll see what he can put together. Ba- basically, this is probably a list of guys that um, the Packers were calling. Right, Packers made a lot of phone calls. Once the draft ends, you're, you're working the phones trying to get these guys to come, and you're going to lose a lot of them. And I'm guessing these are two of the guys they tried to get to come over. They chose other teams. Jacquez chose the Jaguars. Jaguars said no. Packers called him up like, how about now? And he's like, all right, fine. But then yesterday things got pretty interesting because we actually waived Mike Tyson, and I had just gotten a question recently about Mike Tyson asking what my thoughts were on him. Uh, Tyson's been around for a little while. He's in his third year. Uh, he spent two years with Seattle, and um, I don't know. It was a bit of a surprising cut. I don't know if it's a positional thing. Maybe they just feel content with the safeties that they have currently and, and felt like if we're going to free up some space that this just is one of those spots or even if it's not a matter of freeing up space they just looked at it and said this just isn't working but it is surprising he had a decent amount of snaps against Oakland which as I've said is one of those things where you know you jack up the snaps and, and kind of see all right let's see for sure what, what are we going to do with this guy I am a little stunned that a guy like Mike Tyson gets cut when you've got Olive Sagapolu and um, and uh, Nairo who have just been pretty abhorrent the last several weeks. But um, Tyson's been playing free safety as far as how he's graded out. Last week was, you know, arguably his best week. Week two was really bad against Baltimore, but um, seemed to have been a decent enough tackler with the exception of week two. Everything else has been pretty average. But, I mean, either way, you kind of figure this is one of those guys that's not going to make a super big impact on the team. But it's still sort of surprising to me. Maybe it's because he's 26 and he's in his third year. I don't really know seems a little surprising that he gets cut while some of the other guys are still here. But then uh, the final move yesterday, after releasing Mr. Mike Tyson, the Packers went out to um, Jackson Porter, who had spent time with the Baltimore Ravens. Obviously, the Packers now have a connection with the Baltimore Ravens. So the personnel fella, who is now a Packer, um, had obviously vouched for Jackson Porter as being a decent player. And um, somewhat interesting because Porter has not played at all this year. I don't know the circumstances of that. It seems as though he was cut uh, by the Ravens last year and has just been kind of floating ever since. But um, it, from what I can tell, very, very, very good tackler. And if I called him a safety, I apologize. He's a cornerback. I feel like I said safety. Maybe I never said that. But uh, 6'1", 193. He's only 24 years old, so he's still got a lot of years left. Um, coverage was relatively suspect. Over those four preseason games, he was targeted 10 times. Six of those were caught for 95 yards, 15.8 yards per reception, 17 yards after the catch. 38-yarder was the longest. Uh, He only had one pass breakup, no interceptions. Uh, Overall, he had a passer rating of 91.7 when targeted. So, I mean, it's it's preseason, and again, it's a lot of, you know, what, what we're looking for is these kinds of guys. Presumably, they like guys with, you know, the longer arms jam you up. He's, so, you know, if he can play, play press, they're, they're going to give him a shot. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully, at the very least, he can bring some of that Baltimore Ravens nastiness, but he was only there for a year, so we'll see. Either way, the Packers clearly trying to get some better competition at cornerback. Again, I'm, I'm assuming Kadar is, is going to stick around. Now, he could be practice squad, I suppose, if, if things aren't super panning out with Kadar. I know he started off seeming pretty well. I just, I just don't see the Packers cutting a guy unless he's terrible. Typically, you're not going to cut a... A, uh, a draft pick. Now, granted, he's a sixth-round pick, so I, you know, once you get into sixth and seventh, I think guys tend to get cut without too much hesitation. But I, from what I can tell, he's been decent enough. So I, I, I guess in my mind, Jair, Kevin King, Tremont, Tony Brown, Josh Jackson, those are the five that are for sure going to be around pending injuries. Tremont, you know, there's potential. I'm sure the Packers, if they felt comfortable enough, would move on from Tremont, but I doubt that they do especially with Kevin King, who's always injured. Tony Brown, I think, is yeah. Although I tend to think everybody's kind of yeah right now outside of Jair. But anyways, better competition. Hopefully uh, something bears itself out between these three and everybody else that we've got. But anyways, let's take a, uh, a quick break and uh, round out whatever else we have to talk about. So some notes here on uh, the last practice, which was a closed practice close to the public. Apparently the media was on hand because we have notes. Guys that were not practicing, Alan Lazard is still out with his concussion. Equinemius obviously is not playing. Kevin King is injured, obviously. Campbell is on pup. 
Curtis Bolton still has a knee issue. Oren Burks has a shoulder inju- injury. More in- more on that in a little bit. Uh, Malcolm Johnson and KB Ento have a hamstring. Uh, Cole Madison, Jimmy Graham, Corey Lindsley, Reggie Gilbert, Greg Roberts. All these guys are out. On the positive side, Rashawn Gary and David Bakhtiari have both returned to practice after they were out Sunday. Very, very good news about Rashawn Gary, considering we didn't know how serious this was going to be. Again, the presumption that I had on the advisement of a very wise person, a.k.a. a friend who has had a stinger before, good chance he would be back sooner than later, although even with things like that, you don't know exactly how long it's going to last, but having him back is is a great thing. Hopefully, um, this doesn't become a, a, a thing as far as being injured regularly. Because, I mean, that the, the thing... See, this is where I get differentiate between sort of injuries. I suppose you can put it into three categories. There's the unavoidable injury, which is to say there's nothing that you did wrong. Something happened to you that would have injured everyone. Those are basically most of Aaron Rodgers' injuries. There's the second thing where I don't even know what happened, and it doesn't look like much happened, but you're hurt. And that keeps happening to you. That would be generally injury-prone. That's where I would put Kevin King. For Sean Gary, I suppose I would put into a third category in that I can see how you got injured, and that probably would hurt a lot of people. However, that was entirely self-inflicted. Right? He, he tackled a guy from behind, and his neck bent back the way he hit him, and he hurt himself. So be careful, Rashawn, please. Who, by the way, has officially blocked me. I, I believe he's just blocked everybody. I don't know. I just I, I saw somebody posted something to the effect of, now look what you guys did, because I think he just shut down his entire Twitter or made it private. But um, when I click on his profile, it says, you have been blocked. It's like, there's, there's no way. I, as, as adamant as I've been that this guy's a good football player, unless he saw my sarcasm, sarcasm online and took it literally. It's like, come on, man. But anyways, so that that's a thing. Hopefully he is uh, a lot tougher on the field than he is on social media, because clearly, I mean, he just just don't be on social media, right? I mean, what what is the point of, of like pumping out all this positivity stuff and look how great I am, but nobody can see it? Because I don't want anyone to interfere with my positive self-talk. If, if you don't want negativity, get off social media. It's the reason I'm trying to not be on social media. It's like I start to realize I'm in a funk and I'm just not in a good mood. And it's like, yeah, because you've been flipping through Twitter for the last three minutes for no apparent reason. You just get sucked in. Like, oh, there's a notification. Let's see what that is. Five minutes later, I'm sitting in a corner, like, just weeping. I don't know what's wrong with... Oh, yeah, social media again. Everybody's horrible. Um, as far as some, I guess, news or, or thoughts on the injuries, Jimmy Graham, I guess his finger is uh, bandaged up. It seems minor. Uh, actually, it says black tape around a couple of his fingers, so his fingers, are, I guess, are just taped together, which seems to be some of the the lowest level of... Of, you know, this is serious. Uh, Curtis Bolton apparently is walking around fine. No scooter, no crutches, no cast, no limp. So that seems to be a very good sign, but who knows. Um, Some very good news on Oren Burks, at least assuming he ends up being a good football player. But assuming he is, some very good news. Uh, He will be back this season. It's not going to require surgery. And apparently he may not even be put on IR or the, you know, designated to return IR. So, um... Sounds like he will be getting put on the 53. It's not a season-ending deal. And uh, just basically going to be week-to-week as an injured person, maybe after three, four weeks. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the situation is. But um, presumably a good thing. And either way, regardless of how good of a player he is, just based on a depth standpoint, we kind of need him back. So that's about as much as we have learned from uh, camp. And again, don't take all of these. Obviously, Alan Lazard, EQ, um Curtis Bolton. Some of these are very obvious and serious injuries, but some of the things, even like Kevin King's hamstring, as much as that seems to be a recurring thing with him being injured, some of these that are hamstring or whatever, eh, hopefully they're just being super precautious with that. I did it again. Is that a, is that a per- correct context? Why don't I just say super cautious? It's my favorite thing to do is say super precautious. Um, kind of a small note, um, there's an article here by Zach Cruz from Packers Wire which essentially is just uh, commenting on a, a comment from Aaron Rodgers, right? They're asking about the offense, and typically when you get, basically the question is, how's the offense looking at Aaron Rodgers saying, I think it's looking good and whatever. Basically the first part of his, his comment, which is, I think we've had real, two really good practices. I think the tempo's been really high. The efficiency has been good. That's basically a throwaway line. 
Now, Aaron Rodgers, being as honest as he is, probably would tell us if things weren't super great. So, you know, if he says it's good, then it's good. It's just a matter of is it kind of good but not great, or is it really good? We don't really know. But the second portion of this is a little bit more, um, I guess, telling and positive. And he says, quote, Bakhtiari actually pulled me to the side towards the end of practice, and he said, it's looking pretty good out there. What are we doing differently? I said, we're finally running all our stuff. It's in. It's all in at this point. The package to choose from is a lot bigger. It's been fun to see the execution and guys making plays. I like where we're at offensively. So the couple of thoughts I had on this. Number one, the backstory about Bakhtiari pulling him aside kind of adds some context to it that it's not just a throwaway, nonsensical thing. It's it's actually, you know, you've got players saying, hey, this is starting to come together. Now, the, the negative side of this is that clearly there has been another conversation amongst players that things are really not looking very good right now. Right? To say things are looking good, what are we doing differently, would certainly imply that things were not looking good for a period of time. But then the other portion of this is his response to David Bakhtiari, which is, that we're finally running all of our stuff, which adds a little bit of, of clarity in terms of when you look at, say, the offense and things aren't looking very good, why would that be? Well, there's two ways that you can kind of look at this. Number one, you could say that maybe Aaron Rodgers has more options, which is to say, you know, Aaron Rodgers or the, the rest of the quarterbacks have more plays to choose from, but I don't necessarily think that's what he's talking about. Imagine trying to win a game or go out and look even just look good in practice but you've only got about five plays to, to run from it's going to be tough the more plays you add the more you start to get familiar with these things the more you can start calling the appropriate pro play for the appropriate situation you can start calling things to manipulate defenses the more you can start doing things that gives you the advantage especially in an offense that's predicated on calling the right plays based on the situation because the plays themselves are just plays they're, they're plays that you can find in every other playbook in in across every team it's a matter of of the system in which how we call them and all these kinds of things and and calling plays that are beneficial to our our players so you know again when you look at things and things don't look great there, there are several reasons why that might be and this is another one we're starting with a small playbook and building on it and as we build it starts to look better right? it gets harder it gets more complicated to keep this all in your head but the offense is going to start to look better because we have more plays to choose from and i don't actually think this is something that's going to end at the end of preseason. In other words, we got it all down now. I think week one, it, it may still be a somewhat limited playbook and trying to find that, that compromise between giving them, throwing everything at them and um, you know not wanting to do that, but also wanting to be fresh enough to beat the Bears, to have enough in your arsenal to be able to beat this offense or their defense, excuse me. But again, the good thing about that is you're going to see continued growth, right? We, what we see in week one is not going to be the final product. And I'm not trying to say I think we're going to lose. I'm not saying that. But it, it, I just mean that this is going to be a, a process. And as I've said before, this is probably something that's going to carry on into year two. Some of these guys, uh, even Aaron Rodgers, who's probably going to get caught up a lot faster than everyone else, is probably going to, we're going to be hearing quotes in year two about, you know, I feel more comfortable in the system. I'm starting to get more, you know, fluid in it and all this kind of stuff. So think about that as far as how next year is going to be better than this year as we get into September and October. Clearly, they're not going to be at their, their most optimal. It's just a matter of being good enough. And it's a matter of Matt LaFleur trying to find that balance and saying, I need to be able to construct an offense that is complicated enough to beat the defense, but not so complicated that the offense can't effectively execute it. And to just keep building on that. And uh, Corey Lindsley actually said something similar as far as we made strides and you know again the problem is it, it kind of comes sort of in a vacuum what, what what is our starting point made strides from what were we decent and now we've made strides into being good or were we just basically horrific and we've made strides into being pretty bad you don't know I mean strides is strides and you don't know kind of where you are until you get pitted against somebody else. And we have not seen the starting offense go against anybody. And I say that definitively because the starting offense isn't the starting offense without Aaron Rodgers. So we won't know until the full playbook is implemented. The correct plays, as in regular season plays, are being called with Aaron Rodgers under center and everybody else that's starting, starting. We don't know what strides looks like. I don't know if the, the Green Bay Packers officially know what strides look like. They won't know until they smash into the Chicago Bears and, and kind of reevaluate and say, okay, I guess this is where we're at. Right? This, this, is, uh, this is ground zero for us. 
But um, the last thought I had is is apparently the Packers have not made a determination uh, as far as who our left guard is going to be. And I, I think that speaks highly of Elton Jenkins. Um, you know, coming into it, he was he was the clear backup, right? He was not getting starting reps. He's worked his way into getting starting reps. Um, there's no guarantees for anybody. I mean, you've got to earn it, especially when you've got a guy like Lane Taylor, and who I've said is is not super optimal in my mind as far as being elite. I mean, he, he's he's a guy that would start on a lot of teams. He can go to Minnesota. He can go to Houston. He can go to a lot of teams and be a starter and be probably the best player that they have on that entire offensive line, not the Vikings so much anymore, but the Texans probably. But as far as being somebody where you can say, okay, we're set, right? Bakhtiari, we're set. Balaga, as long as he's on the team, we're set. You're not going to go out and find somebody that's available that's better. Corey Lindsley, we're set. You know, Billy Turner for right now, I'm comfortable. We'll see how it goes. Lane Taylor is is, is mediocre. But still, that that's... You take mediocre and a guy that understands the offense, that that's understands the calls and has a relationship standing between Corey Lindsley and, and, da- and David Bakhtiari and, and understands the communication with Aaron Rodgers and the calls and the, the, the just everything, it... It's gonna be kind of take. It's gonna take a lot for a guy like Elton Jenkins to take that spot. You you not only have to be better, you have to be significantly better, because there's there's nothing really wrong with being a backup for a while, and you'll get that spot when you're fully ready. So the fact that it's about fifty fifty right now, I'm 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 leaning toward he could be the week one starter. Um, at the very least, you know, not even including injuries. Obviously, any injuries that happen, he's he's gonna get thrust into that spot. I, I just mean I think he's going to win that job. Clearly, before the year is over, pending any serious situation, I, I think he's been ascending. I think he's done a great job. There's a lot to learn and a lot to know. I, I just, I legitimately think he's just a better football player, which would make sense. Obviously, he's a he's a younger guy. He's more athletic. Uh, he's a second round pick for a reason, right? He's just better at this than than a guy like Lane Taylor is, who's who's worked really hard to get where he is and has earned his spot. Not trying to sit here and dump on the guy all day long, but. Um, you know, you just you never know. You would expect a second round pick to come in and take that spot relatively easily, but it's still a lot of work for a guy that does not know how to even be a pro yet to come in and unseat a guy who's been with this team for a pretty long time. But um, I, I do expect that to happen. I don't know if it'll necessarily be week one, but I, I kind of see it as a 50 50 thing, and, and it'll be a come down to do we want to just stick with old reliable or do we want to try to thrust him in because we think he's ready. And again, I, I think maybe already right now Elton Jenkins might be a better uh, pass blocker. But there's some there's a mental component to this. It's not all just, you know, who's more athletic, who's, you know, as far as tell somebody here comes a bull rush, now try to stop it, right? Defensive coordinators are very smart. They're going to manipulate you mentally, get you out of position. And, and, you know, defensive linemen are very intelligent. And we, we saw that, that video. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but I think I posted it with Akeem Hicks talking about how he got a read on a, a, a Packers lineman. I think it was Byron Bell or, or McCray, one of the two. But it was the way he was kind of sitting back on his heels. He knew he was going to pull. So he knew he had to reach Corey Lindsley. So he went out and got in front of Corey Lindsley and blew up the play because Byron Bell tipped off what the play was. That's a mental thing. you got to be able to understand that kind of stuff and, and not give the defense any tells on what you're going to do. Those are veteran-type things, and those are the kinds of reasons why you might lean toward a guy like Lane Taylor who's been around long enough. But um, anyways, them's my thoughts for the day. Uh, We will be back tomorrow to talk about I don't know what. But you folks, enjoy your Tuesday. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye.